Well, welcome everybody to this uh, AIV 2020 webinar. Uh, thank you very much for all joining us here live from Paris or on the phone. Um, I believe we have a, a substantial number of participants. Uh, my name is Roger Tatoul. I'm Deputy Director at the International Aid Society and Director of the Global HIV Vaccine Enterprise. Um, this webinar, uh, which I will share, share, is organized by the European AIDS Vaccine Alliance, an EU-funded program that brings together over 20 institutions across Europe and led by Professor Robin Chatok, Chair of Mucosa Immunology at the Imperial College in London, a member of this panel. Uh, I will proceed um, immediately to, uh, to the panel and ask the panelists to introduce them themselves, starting by, by Suzanne on the right. Yes, hello. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Susan Barnett. I work for the Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I work as a senior program officer in the group that oversees the HIV investments. Hello, uh, I'm Professor Robin Shattuck of the Imperial College, and I'm coordinator of the European AIDS Vaccine Initiative. My name is Athena Kilpilainen. I'm an EV2020 PhD student, a young researcher working at the Weidebron Institute de Recerca in Barcelona. Hello, everybody. My name is Roger Legrand. I am director of the department which hosts uh, this meeting today and my expertise in, in, is in preclinical research in infectious diseases. Thank you very much. So prior to this call, we have asked uh, for questions that were submitted to us and we are going to go through this question and the panel will answer them. For the question we do not have the time to answer, we will try to provide an answer in writing which will be made available at a later time online on the EAV website. Um, I'll start uh, directly with the burning question. The search for HIV vaccine has been going on for nearly 40 years. It has been frustrating for researcher, for funder, for the public, and for those most uh, vulnerable population. And the science is progressing very quickly. There are new discoveries uh, all the time. So why is it difficult, so difficult, to develop an HIV vaccine? And I'll handle that to, the, to Professor Shatok. Thank you. So I, I'll just highlight a few reasons why making an HIV vaccine has been particularly complex. If this was another virus, we probably would have made a vaccine within a five-year period. But HIV has become highly evolved to survive in humans and avoid the immune res response. You're probably all familiar with influenza, and influenza changes year on year, and we make a new influenza vaccine every year um, that there's a new strain. Now, if you think about the global diversity of influenza, that's almost as much diversity as you get in a single HIV-infected individual. So the diversity of HIV is so much greater than any other virus that having a vaccine that can hit all the strains that are circulating around the world is extremely challenging. And then the virus has become well adapted to really avoid the immune system. And it does this by shielding the parts of the virus that are targeted by neutralizing antibodies by covering them with sugar and making them very labile so that they fall apart and distract the immune response, making responses against parts of the virus that have no effect. And then finally, the virus can infect cells, and if it's not inhibited, it becomes latent. And once that virus hides as a latent virus, it's with you for life. And most vaccines that we have made in the past are not able to get rid of latent viral infections. Thank you, Robin. I don't know if someone else wants to add something from the panel. Thank you. So I'm going to move to, to Atina. You, you decided to, to start a career in the field of HIV vaccine. Uh, you're aware of all these difficulties. So why do you want to do that? So the reason I decided to get into this field was when I was a bachelor student, I took a course on global health. Um, and we got to go to Tanzania to study the healthcare systems. And when I was there, I met people living with HIV and I got to see the effects that it has on the people. Um, and I think that a lot of people my age and in Europe forget that people are actually still dying. And I think that's really what motivated me. I mean, it's challenging, but I think it's well worth the effort. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to move more on to, your, the, to the, the process development or the development of an HIV vaccine. And it's a long, complicated process, but 
often it starts well it starts at the bench and, and, and then it's gonna move into animal model and we have someone who knows a lot about animal model so I'm gonna ask Roger um, how do animal model help discovering in the discovery phase and do we still need them what do they bring on the table so indeed this is a very important question I think that the the way to address that is uh, what cannot be do in the human which needs to be explored in animal models before or during the process of a development of a product or a strategy for prevention. I think the first thing we have to recognize is that models by definition have limitations, all of them, animal models, in vitro models, and also in silico models. So the, the reason why we use these models is that uh, we need to accelerate these strategies, we need to test uh, uh, different approaches very upstream we can do a clinical trial in many cases and and so we need something which mimics as uh, as much as we can what will be the human situation of course models and particularly animal models cannot answer any question we have to address to solve the HIV problem but we need to identify which are the real specific questions that can be addressed in animal models in order to go further in the investigation. So I may give some examples. And uh, the first thing is what have we learned from animal model studies for the HIV transmission and treatment, for instance, and then the specific situation of the HIV vaccines and any type of vaccine, of course. So one of the very added value of animal models uh, is that we can go to explore deep in the tissues the interactions between the virus and the body, which is, of course, for obvious reasons, very difficult to address in humans. If you want to look at the brain, for instance, or if you want to look at the mucosal sites where the virus is transmitted. So many of what we know so far on the mechanisms, for instance, of uh, vaginal transmission, cervical vaginal transmission, or rectal transmission of the virus came from very early studies in animal models. So this is for sure. Then many of the uh, knowledge today on the distribution of the virus in the body, the identification of the main tissues that replicate the viruses, and the main tissues where there is some persistence of the viruses and the antiretroviral therapy when the virus is completely absent from detection in the blood, for instance, came also from animal models because this capacity we have to look at the gut, to look at the brain, to look at the lymphoid tissues, uh, and to go in deep characterization of the cells, of the molecules in these tissues that interact. From the very beginning, of, at the very early stage of the infections up to the late stage, but particularly at the very early stage, where the uh, infection cannot already be identified in the human, so we can monitor what happened from the first minute of interaction in the, with the individual in this case. So an example for the treatment approaches, for instance, we are tracking, for instance, at the moment, the viral reservoir. So we have to go into tissue for that. We need to look at whether the drugs properly goes into these tissues are efficient. Another example is for the pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. The tenofovir or TTF drug was clearly identified way before uh, uh, in the animal models, uh, before it was considered for the, for the use in clinical trials. So that was the real proof that the pre-exposure prophylaxis can be achieved with an antiviral, antiretroviral drug. And this drug is today one of the most famous drug uses for treatment of HIV patients and for prevention, uh, of course. Then came the specific situation of the vaccines. So we have to be aware that the a vaccine is one of the unique medical products that is injected to a healthy individual. For this reason, uh, we need a very cautious assessment of the safety uh, and the balance between the safety and the tolerability of what we inject in the individuals. That's why uh, the, the use of animals is quite uh, uh, important in the field, in the, in the vaccine. What, for any type of vaccine, I would say, actually. And particularly for the HIV vaccine in this case. Not only because we need to look at the early interaction, everything, but just because we just to inject that for a healthy individual. 
The other reason we need the animal models uh, for an HIV vaccine is that uh, when you will do a prophylactic vaccine, meaning that you want to prevent from infection, if we go to the human, you will not know who will be infected first and or, or not. Then you have to deal with large population and individuals where there is some case, where there are some cases of infection, so what we call the incidence of infection, and we deal to this, to, to, with this incidence to try to assess by statistical methods whether we have an efficacy at preventing the incident, uh, at diminishing the incidence of uh, uh, the uh, the virus uh, in this uh, population. So, meaning why, if if we have, for instance, an area where we have a two percent incidence of infection uh, with HIV, that means that we will need between twenty and fifty thousand people in each arm uh, of the vaccine studies. Uh, that means that uh, if we, we may have to deal with the 50 to 100,000 people in the, in the program. Also, HIV is a very slow spreading disease. So you will need about three years to have the first uh, uh, evaluation of the impact of the vaccines against this incidence. And then if you want to look at the impact not only on the transmission of the virus, the acquisition of the virus, but also on the disease progression after infection, because we may expect that the individuals that have been vaccinated may have a slower disease if by uh, any reason he became infected or she became infected, you will need to wait between five, 10 years. And if you want to have a clear assessment of all the safety issues that can be related to the infection in this population, you may need to, about, to wait for it about 13 to 15 years. So that's explained why there were very, very few clinical trials in phase three, so efficacy trials, so far for an HIV vaccine. So the use of animal models can certainly accelerate that because we have the possibility to challenge experimentally the animals with the real viruses by different routes and then have to assess and have to try to identify which are the best candidates that can be pushed forward for a clinical trial. That was very, very helpful in identifying what will be the best vaccine, for instance, in the last uh, four, six clinical trials already ongoing for phase four, for efficacy, and was very important for that part. And meanwhile, it's not only to to anticipate to do really preclinical work before doing the clinical trial, but it's still used, the animal models are still used during the early phase of uh, clinical trials, phase one and phase two in many cases, in order to optimize this trial because we can start with a, a, a definition of an antigen, but we will need to refine the use of the adjuvant, the, refine the use of the route, uh, refine the, the, the schedule for injecting the vaccines. And these may need to, uh, um, to include a lot of individuals in uh, the different arms uh, of a clinical trial. So if we can anticipate that in animal models, we can really focus on the best approaches for doing that in the human. For that reason, uh, the use of animal models at the moment could not be avoidable. Thank you. So you, you talked a bit about the, uh, the kind of response we expect from a vaccine. Uh, I think that we're developing a vaccine with the aim to, to trigger an immune response. There are multiple type of response. W w the production of antibody is one of them. Um, we have heard, uh, we often hear in, in the news or in you know, scientific publication about neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibody. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Atina, could you tell us a, a bit more about the difference between uh, neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibody? Okay, so in lay terms, um, a neutralizing antibody is an antibody that binds the virus in a way that stops it from being able to infect more cells, which um, effectively means that you're taking it out of the game. Um, so a non-neutralizing antibody will also bind the virus, but it could have a different function, such as acting as a flag to alert the rest of the immune system. Like, here's a virus. I don't know if anybody has anything else to add to that, or? I think that's a great, uh, a great description, <laughs> and I think uh, the, the other aspect of non-neutralizing antibodies is they can flag the cells that have become mm, infected that's true. for the immune system to delete those cells. 
Thank you. And we could add one other perspective. <laughs> um, thus far, only non-neutralizing antibodies have been demonstrated to be, or thought to be protective, non-neutralizing in a vaccine setting in human subjects. Only non-neutralizing. Now, the problem is it's not perfect. It's incomplete protection. But it's the only proof of concept we have to date that we can make an HIV vaccine for humans. So we're left with the struggle where the neutralizing antibodies are the holy grail, yet they're very, very difficult to make. So personally, I would say we can't forget both of these, neutralizing and non-neutralizing. I think they're both part of the picture. And if we want to raise protection against HIV broadly, we're going to have to harness the whole immune system. But that's an opinion, and it's highly controversial. Thank you. Robin? <laughs> Fine. I don't think it's that controversial. I think everybody in <laughs> HIV agrees we need to harness as much activity of the immune system to get rid of the virus. Thank you. Um, it's a question of how much is needed to provide a level of protection that's becomes meaningful for a vaccine in terms of a real world use. We'll have a question on that and we'll come back to that. But I'll stay a little bit more on these, uh, these antibodies. So the vaccine, one of the aim of the vaccine is to trigger put these protective antibodies. So some people came with the idea, why not use the antibody directly as a vaccine? So that's kind of a different kind of uh, thinking. I mean, how realistic it is, and I'm going to ask Roger to to, to consider using antibodies directly to prevent HIV infection? Well, in terms of efficacy, it's realistic, no doubt about it. Uh, what we may consider uh, is, uh, at the moment, what will be the advantages for the future development to use antibodies and maybe the limitation of the use of the antibodies. I think that all of us are really carefully scrutinizing the new results coming from clinical trial we just started a few years ago and we don't have so far the the, the whole picture and the, and the clear view of what we what will these antibodies will become in the future for treatment or prevention I think that the 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 advantages uh, we expect from antibodies first is that to address new targets uh, uh, for uh, uh, the therapy. Uh, uh, because, of course, the, we know that the antiretroviral drugs so far haven't uh, succeeded to cure from infection. So if we can add something that can go further in the limitation of replication or what we call the viral reservoir in the body, probably that will be very, very helpful. The second advantage of the antibodies is that uh, the last long term, long in the long term in the body. So we may expect weeks of activity, even months of activity for some of them, depending on how we design these antibodies. Meaning that we may need a single injection or very few injections spaced on, uh, uh, on the time to, do, to contribute to treatment or to contribute to prevention. And even for prevention, for instance, as a pre-exposure prophylaxis, it will be much more interesting than taking a daily drug. Uh, for being prevented from uh, accidental exposure or sexual exposure. So that's the thing is for, that would be very promising to think to, to have these antibodies for that part. Uh, that could be also an advantage, for instance, for prevention transmission of the kids uh, just at the, uh, at the moment of the burst, uh, because one single injection may prevent for months and may prevent from mother to trash to, to child transmission by breath feeding, for instance. That could be very, very important uh, uh, and uh, limit the use of drugs that may have their adverse effects in the kids, however. So the other thing uh, uh, we have to consider now is also the limitation that can be associated with the antibodies. I don't think that the cost will be one because if we use uh, the antibodies at the several as with, um, with injections that are really spaced on time, it will not really uh, improve the cost. And there are many ways today to, de to damage the cost of that. But the limitations may come first uh, that uh, we are not sure so far whether they are fully efficient or they may induce resistance. So that's uh, things we are all working carefully at the moment. Uh, so that could be one of the limitations. The other limitations 
are coming from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the classical limitation of the antibodies. Pro antibodies are large proteins. Uh, these proteins, uh, even, the, uh, even if they can be engineered to be accepted by the body, has some uh, immunogenicity, so the body can react against these antibodies. And the, and the uh, 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 administrations, the multiple administration of the antibodies can induce antibodies against the antibodies. And that is known for the other monoclonal antibodies that are used as therapeutics today in other diseases, in autoimmune diseases, for instance, uh, where we know that with time we have these autoantibodies that can and reduce the efficacy. So that may be an issue for the long-term use of the antibodies in treatment and prevention against HIV. Thank you. Um, so as I said earlier, the development of a vaccine is a complex and long process with different steps, a different type of approach, different school of thought. How, how, Robin, how does the work of the uh, ARV sit in, this, uh, in relation to this global effort? Thank you, Roger. I mean, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, so EV2020, although it coordinates research across 21 different institutions uh, throughout the EU, is only one small player in the global community. Um, we're part of one of two programs, in fact, in the EU. Um, and what we're doing is a very unique piece of research. Um, it's, it's a large piece of research. We're taking new concepts through uh, early preclinical development into early clinical trials. Um, and what we're doing is synergistic with other parts of research going on in the rest of the world. When I teach students, I often say that developing an HIV vaccine is probably one of the biggest challenges, biological challenges, of a generation. So the other aspect of the program is we are absolutely trying to ensure that we train the next generation, of which Athena is one, of researchers who will be needed to actually realize an HIV vaccine. And the other aspect of the EV program is it's time limited. It only has a five-year funding um, portfolio, and we're towards the end of that five years. And so we have to collaborate with other partners because the products that we develop will need to be handed on to others to take to the next stage. And it's m quite likely that we may end up partnering with uh, groups in the US because in the US there is a much stronger commitment to continuation or, or, or continual funding for a longer period of time. And in the e EU, we actually have a kind of stop-start uh, approach to funding where an initiative like this runs for about five years, but then we have to wait for another call for a new initiative. So the only way that we can maintain momentum is, to buy, is by partnering with others. And HIV is a global problem, so it requires global science and global coordination in order for us to actually realize uh, this, this unmet need of a preventative HIV vaccine. Thank you. Um, beyond the scientific and technical difficulties, Suzanne, is there other factors that are slowing down the development of a vaccine. Yes, thanks, thanks for Roger. Um, yes, I could talk about that for days. <laughs> there are many, many challenges. And, and, and I, I want to highlight the one that Robin brought up, the, the continuity of funding and continuity of excitement and enthusiasm and optimism, the continuity of the talent pool. They're all very important. They're critical aspects. And I, I had a history in industry for 30 years and I went through three companies and I saw a vaccine company that was there at the very beginning, cloning, isolating the virus, and I saw them lose their interest over time. And I went out to the outside and started getting grant funding. So grant funding at the level and continuity of investment at the level we see in the US should be more widespread globally. So I, I, have, I really want to reiterate that. Um, the other barriers. Um, First of all, that I want to keep away from HIV ex exceptionalism. That's, we always we live in the HIV world. It's a daunting problem. Vaccines are very, very difficult to develop and deploy. We're in a very anti-vaccine world right now. People are people. They 
don't take drugs or treatments when they're not sick. So right from the get-go, we have obstacles. Um, we heard from Ro Roger that it's difficult to bring new products into people because there's safety considerations. And, and for vaccinologists, we're primarily um, vaccinating healthy individuals. So there are enormous regulatory hurdles. Um, when we think about bringing a vaccine into into global population, we have to deal with multiple different, different types of people and cohorts and considerations. It's not just one vaccine for the world. All the people are the same. Each cohort has different needs and different demand for the vaccine. So the complexity of, of deploying such a vaccine is enormous. And that's what keeps vaccine companies away. Um, it's a difficult path. Um, it's po highly politically charged. It's high risk. Um, it's a long, long commitment to provide a product or products at very low margin, and the stockholders don't like it. So over the years, we've seen vaccine companies diminish in the world. And with the anti-vaccine sentiment, I, I think it's, it hasn't helped at all. So that, that's one major thing. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that the, the population that needs an HIV vaccine most are young adults. Young adults don't typically get vaccinated. Uh, maybe with, uh, with Gardasil, yes, now. But there wasn't a model for that. You get the, the kids early, and then they disappear. And then you know they, they might come for a flu shot. They might not. So it's a very difficult population, even in the US and, and, and the Western uh, world. It's very difficult to, to capture adolescents and young people as a cohort. So we have to develop new models for that. Um, you know, and, and so we can deploy them. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, I think I've covered it pretty well for now. So anybody have anything to add? We can all come up with our pet challenge. Do, do, do you think that the change in the in global health priorities are, are affecting vaccine development? Maybe? I think that they have a very yeah. major impact. And I, I think we're all aware of emerging threats and emerging threats like Ebola and Zika always hit the headlines and they are important but you have to remember that in terms of HIV there's still a million and a half or more individuals getting infected every year. In the 2014 Ebola outbreak which was a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, we're only talking about uh, 11,000 individuals who became infected. So it proportionally, year on year, HIV has an enormous toll on the human population. But the problem is that people have got familiar with HIV. And we'll talk about treatment later. Treatment has been very successful where you can access treatment. So people who are diagnosed today early in the developed world can expect to live a normal lifespan. But what that means is people are now no longer seeing HIV as an acute problem in the developed world. Yet in the developing world or lower mid middle income countries, it is still killing a huge number of individuals and having a major impact on individuals' lives. And I think the danger is that it will become a disease of poverty that the world has become so familiar and complacent about that they will start to lose interest and there will start to be, to be less political emphasis on solving this critical problem. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you... I mean, you no, I was going to say, Robin, you brought up a good point. You know, he's talking about the diversity of populations. Um, in the West, we have PrEP, and it's working. <laughs> and when we're doing uh, late-phase clinical trials in Africa, in certain populations, many populations, there's no uptake. So we really have to be sensitive um, that there's men we need to keep vaccine in our toolbox. Um, and, and that's one of the challenges. We really have to empathize with others in the world and, and, and hear their side of the story and not make assumptions about where we direct our efforts. Um, you know, I was at the IAS conference and I heard somebody give a, a talk about, you know, not wanting to take drugs when she's, she was healthy and feeling like her partner would feel she was cheating if she did, and it opened my eyes up. Yes, a vaccine would be much easier. You wouldn't have to hide everything day by day. So those are the types of perspectives I think we have to take in, in the work we do. 
I'm, I'm glad you bring the topic of people back into the conversation because ultimately, as you said, we'll have to deliver a product to people and we want to make sure our people are prepared to take this product and happy to use it. And that's not true just for vaccines. So what is being done to ensure that these vulnerable population are part of the research and what is going to be done and needs to be done to ensure that they will benefit from that research? And it's not going to be just about developing a vaccine for which country. Yeah, I mean, I think part of that is planning ahead and being prepared. And I, at, the, at the Gates Foundation right now, we're, we're doing a lot of focusing on end user. And I know you are as well. Um, we have to consider the people who will take the drug and take the vaccine and, and how they will take it and what they will not do. Um, right now, we've got scientists planning vaccines. And I don't know if our target product profiles are set for people who are in certain populations of the world who cannot go six times to get a vaccine and spend a lot of money. So we've got to have those people in mind, people who might take one or two doses, but we, we, we have vaccines right now that are very complex and they're basically prototypes of what would be more readily delivered when we eventually deploy in a large way. So the, the, the the prevention landscape is changing, and you talked about PrEP, and you said PrEP is available in, in the North or in the US, although not in all countries. It's, it's also available in, in Africa, but limited access. But we know PrEP works. So is it still feasible, possible, to do HIV trial, efficacy trial, in the context of PrEP, where it, it, it would be unethical not to provide PrEP? So I think that's a really good question, and I think it's a really important question, and I think Everything we have that reduces the number of HIV infections is actually a victory. So, you know, even in, you know, implementing, encouraging the use of condoms, safe sex, fact, uh, safe sex practices, that reduces the, the incidence, the number of new infections, that's a victory. The introduction of PrEP where it's used and where people can access and want to use it and it reduces the number of infections is a fantastic victory. People are working on monoclonals. Um, and maybe monoclonals will be able to be injected once a year, or there may be antiretroviral drugs that can be used and work once a year. All of those will have a positive impact on the number of new infections, and that's something we should celebrate. But it will make it harder to test an HIV vaccine because it means that the number of people who become infected is less. That's a fantastic thing, but it will make it more expensive to get to that end game and prove that a vaccine works. But in spite of all the advances, we still know that the people who are most vulnerable to HIV infection don't actually think they're going to become infected with HIV, and so they're not accessing PrEP. We know that st studies have demonstrated that for women in particular, the highest risk in many parts of the world where incidence is very high of becoming HIV infected is actually being in a stable relationship because that's when you start to trust your partner and you stop taking PrEP or you stop using condoms because if you're doing that, your partner may think that you're actually being unfaithful. So for sure, we need a vaccine. There are populations that will never be able to access or use these other intervention strategies. And if we really want to protect everybody who's vulnerable and at risk to HIV, a vaccine is the only solution. So thinking about protection, uh, we know PrEP work and PrEP work, PrEP work quickly. What about a vaccine, Roger? How long would it take to get, how long do we think, or can we imagine how long it would take for a vaccine to become protective? Um, uh, my next question would be how many immunizations, because you talk about people having to come back a number of times. So in terms of not talking about TPP, but in terms of an ideal vaccine, how many immunization and how long before you're protected? Yeah, just before I answer your question, I may just continue on the comments of Robin, uh, saying that uh, certainly to uh, uh, um, impact the epidemics, we will need a diversity of approaches. So no single approach has 100% advantages. So there are limitations for each of them. So combining them will help to more have more um, approaches that can circumvent the virus. All, the other thing is that uh, we may also expect that some approaches synergize between them. And we have 
working on that with Robin Shattuck, say, uh, on the capacity of uh, obtaining these synergies between vaccines and PrEP or vaccine and microbicides. And so it should be demonstrated so far, but we may expect these kind of things. So how, 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 we can, how we should use the vaccine or what we expect from the vaccine, I think ideally what we need is one single injection for life. This is what we all expect. <laughs> And, that, and this is what we has been achieved for the data fever vaccines or the tetanus toxoid vaccine almost. So we have and one shot every 10 years just by uh, precaution, but we, don't, we may not need so far. Measles virus worked perfectly for years, uh, almost life. So that's, that's what we expect from a vaccine. So uh, for, for the HIV, the, the difficulty is, is certainly uh, so far that uh, uh, in natural infection to have a good response that may contribute uh, to protection and particularly to obtain these antibodies that have broad uh, efficacy, uh, we, we need to expect about two years. And we don't know really why so far. Uh, and so that's why uh, the, 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 there is a lot of work on trying to accelerate this part. Uh, the, the other thing is that we have multiple injections. Why we don't have multiple injections so far uh, is that we don't, we don't know how to do better. <laughs> so, uh, so far in our models, and particularly in, an, in animal models, we know that to obtain neutralized antibodies with some efficacy, uh, we need more than three, four, five injections. And we don't know how much we need to space the, these injections. So that's, this is where we are. And what we are here, that's uh, actually what we lack in the HIV field. It's a clear understanding of the mechanisms that helps uh, this maturation of the immune response. We can understand that. We may try then uh, uh, find a way to accelerate this process by adjuvants, antigen design, and what, this is what the people do. So I think the, the, the major point today is that for this new vaccines, very challenging vaccine field, what we need is basic science, most of it. So we need clearly to understand how the host reacts against the vaccines, how fast they react, what are the key mechanisms that can orient uh, impact on the duration uh, or the response, and, and so we, we, we still, we, we, are, we are now acquiring knowledge about that. But in the past, for many years, we were using vaccines without knowing how they work. We knew that they work, we confirmed that they work, uh, but we lack the clear understanding on these mechanisms, which is really important for vaccines like HIV, TB, and all these challenges vaccines. Thank you. So you mentioned the, the, dreaded, the dreaded word efficacy. So I'll have to ask, and I'm going to ask all of you, uh, so far we only have one study showing that a vaccine was efficacious. Uh, it was a Thai study, the ERV144. The level was 31% protection. That uh, product wasn't taken directly further. A new products were derived from this study and are currently being tested into the uh, HVTN702 study. But imagine wh when we get the results, how efficacious would it need to be? And you don't have to give me a, a number, but I'd love to have you, your perspective. Starting by Suzanne. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's a difficult question. We have two efficacy trials right now with two different endpoints. Um, one is 50% with a lower bound of 25%, and the other is, I believe, 70 or 80 percent. 65, 70. Yeah, it's very high. <laughs> and uh, so we have a level of efficacy that will have a population benefit, that will actually have value. It will save people from getting infected. It will protect people. And then there's a level that has some kind of health economic benefit that the people who pay for the vaccine have to agree with. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, and then there's also the business model. Um, how it will be made, right, based on the efficacy level. So if we were to come out of these trials with an efficacy of 80, 90 percent, I think there'd be a lot of enthusiasm to create a business model, be it a novel business model or one of the companies that's already involved in one of these to take it all the way and bring it to 
both the developed world and the developing world, that could happen. I think the optimism would go up with a higher efficacy. I think where we're going to have trouble is in the 50% level, because as I said before, the present vaccines are pretty cumbersome for global deployment, four administrations or six administrations, and that's what we're looking at. So um, I think cost effective is a relative term to what population you're going into and the level um, of efficacy um, that is the threshold wherein the companies will start being enthous enthusiastic and show up. I th also think you're asking the wrong people. Because <laughs> I thought you were asking the wrong question. No, the, the question is right, but I mean, obviously, the level of efficacy and whether you want to have a vaccine depends on your risk and your level of exposure. So if you're living in a part of the world where you have family members who have died from HIV or are living with HIV, and or you're in a, a population where you have friends who are uh, living with HIV or at high risk, you might accept a vaccine that is 50% protected or even lower. Whereas if you think that you're only remotely going to be exposed to HIV, you might want something that's 90% uh, efficacious. So the question really needs to go to a community. When we have a vaccine that's 50% protective, and it depends on how long that 50% lasts, we need to be out talking to the communities that might want to use that vaccine and say, is it acceptable? And if they want that vaccine, we need to make it available. But if they say, well, it's way too low, then there's no point of moving it forward. Okay. Atina, would you have a, what lack of efficacy would you like? I think it's a really difficult question. But I do think that, for me, anything over 50% sounds better than nothing. I mean, if half the people are protected, you know what I mean? If that's the best we could do at this time, for instance, I would take it, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Jorge. Well, I, I think that uh, any, any number, any efficacy that can really impact on the incidence of the virus is fine. So uh, I, I, in, in terms of if it can help to control the virus, even if it's very little impact, I think it's already something achieved. Thank you. So let's imagine it's 2021, the two ongoing efficacy trial released their results. It's a fantastic vaccine. It has fantastic efficacy. How long before people will have access to this vaccine? Suzanne, if you want to give us an idea. Um, all right, I've seen the timelines. <laughs> uh, well, all right, so for one of them, one of the vaccine candidates, um, there is an industry partner that's on board, and if they reach their targets, they were giving licensure um, within years. I mean, I was seeing the path. They're already engaging regulatory authorities, so it's around 2024, 2025 time of frame, I believe. I don't know if anybody has any better numbers, but that's what I've seen. Um, for the other vaccine, it's going to be more difficult because the company isn't on board and, and the, the products, there has to be an alliance to plan to, to make the products and put them through a real regulatory path. So that could take between five, well, I'd say five to 10 years. But that's licensure. More. What about yeah. manufacture, delivery yeah. in country? Yeah, so um, I'd say a long time. We're not looking for anything coming fast. For the first product I mentioned, I think like pr delivery could be quicker because they have the manufacturing in place and the process ready. But I, I mean, I think it's important to say why does it take so long? Because I think people you know, would wonder, you, you get something that has 50, 70, 80% effective, why is it not immediately available? But we have to remember that, that actually the chances of success are low we're always optimistic, but you need to have multiple shots at goal to have something that works. And in conventional vaccine development outside of HIV, it's, you're not usually just having one trial and you get there. Um, and to scale up a vaccine costs hundreds of millions of dollars. So for a company to invest hundreds of millions of dollars now on something that has a relatively low chance of being uh, a highly efficacious vaccine. There isn't a mechanism to support that. Actually, the mechanism that support the scale-up 
is the success of the trial. And then I think if it's 80%, 90% efficacious, there will be no, no problem with getting the global community to ramp up the funding to put it in. But that delay is just inevitable because nobody's going to build a factory. And this has happened for other vaccines. Dengue, for example, a large pharma co company thought they were going to have a successful dengue vaccine, and they spent hundreds of millions on a facility that then was never used because the vaccine didn't give the level of efficacy that they were hoping for. So we have to be realistic in terms of global priorities and available availability of funding for these approaches. Any further comment on, on that question? Okay. Um, going back a little bit to more the technicality of, of the, uh, the vaccine itself, and we talk about vaccine for adults, but what about vaccine for infant and adolescent? Because that's usually when you get vaccinated. Uh, how much work is being done on, on, on that? And I leave any of you to answer that. So, so I'll start. I mean, obviously, um, safety is paramount in terms of testing a vaccine in the first place. And so that's why all vaccine trials start in adults, because that's, uh, you know, adults can give ethical permission to, to be in a trial, and that's the starting point. But we do need a vaccine that works for adolescents and for infants. Um, and in terms of development, HIV vaccines that are tested in adults will then move to being tested in adolescents. And ideally, in terms of the population that you want to vaccinate, um, a vaccine program that could be put aside alongside something like the papilloma scheme that's been very effective where it's been introduced into adolescents would be the ideal population. Um, and I'm going to pass over to Athena because she's actually working on a project looking at developing vaccines for infants. Yeah, so my research group works with the development of BCG-based HIV vaccines, and BCG is currently the vaccine against tuberculosis. Uh, it's a live attenuated bacteria. Um, it's mainly given to infants shortly following birth. It has a very long safety record, and vaccination is not affected by maternal antibodies. So our work, um, we're using BCG to deliver an HIV vaccine, to be able to give it to children, basically, shortly following birth. So we are still in preclinical development, but hopefully it will work. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, we mostly talked about vaccine that would prevent infection, but there are also vaccines that are being developed that would be used as a therapeutic vaccine, which means to be using people who are infected to kind of cure them. Roger, would you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so as you say, there, 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 are, there could be different objectives for an immune inter intervention that could be a prophylactic vaccine or what we call a therapeutic vaccine. So prophylactic is for prevention. We talked about uh, a lot uh, during the session now. Uh, but we may try indeed to reinforce the capacity of the host to control the infection in an infected individual by doing stimulation of the immune response. And this is the way we think to use a that uh, therapeutic vaccines. So there is still a controversy to, to, within the scientific community on the uh, capacity of the host to respond to these therapeutic vaccines uh, and whether we need to, to, to have a specific strategy or not for these vaccines. I can give you my personal view on this act is that uh, these are so different purposes that we need different type of vaccines and designs uh, which are uh, really aiming for prophylactic and could be very different if we do something for therapeutic. So it's, it's completely different situation in this case. So the prophylactic, what we want is to induce with very few injections, a very long-term memory protective response. Uh, that's what we commented earlier. If you do one single injection for life, it would be perfect. Uh, in therapeutic vaccine, we can consider that very differently. First, uh, it may be not the same antigen a product we, we may use in the vaccine because we may want to elicit different type of responses. We may 
try to induce antibodies, but maybe also the T cell response are almost more important in a therapeutic vaccine uh, than in a prophylactic vaccine. So the way we will address the antigen, we will inject the vaccine, will, can be different in these cases. Uh, we may also try to maintain a high level of immunity, for instance, by doing very repeatedly injection of the vaccines, like, like what we do for uh, vaccine for cancer, for instance, in, in, in therapeutic vaccine for cancers. So we may inject every, two, every week or every two weeks to maintain high level of the effector. So we may not need memory, but we need this efficiency of the effectors. So for that purpose, the way we will design that, it will be diff very different. Thank you. I think we are reaching near near the end of this webinar. I've got one final question for, for which I'd like everybody's perspective. Uh, clearly, the prevention landscape is changing. We've got PrEP, we've got treatment as prevention, we've got U, equal U. Do we still need a vaccine? I think, again, I'm, I'm asking a question we all think probably the same thing. But how can we strengthen the message? What do we need to do now? What, what would be as a matter of urgency would we need to do? So, I don't know if I'm going to <laughs> address your urgency question, but I think, you know, I can tell, tell from a personal perspective, I think that HIV has taught us a lot over 30 years, and I'm very op optimistic. I think what HIV, the study of HIV uh, has taught us about immunology will help us to unlock the way to make a vaccine, and I would not abandon it now. I think we've got a lot of optimism right now. Um, we have incredible capacity to, to mine data that we were never able to mine with the computational um, capabilities we have now. So people are measuring all kinds of things and using new science to tackle this in a big way. So I'm very optimistic and I think, um, you know, we, we should have a sense of urgency, but I think we can do much sm smarter science now since we've been educated for 30 years. So I often think about you know, historical examples. And we are hopefully poised to eliminate polio as a virus globally. And if you look back in history when polio was sweeping across America and we had warehouses of people in iron lungs, there were many people who said getting a polio vaccine was too difficult a problem. It was too expensive. We shouldn't fund it. It's just not going to be done. And then we realized a vaccine that's almost eliminated that virus from the world. And I say that that's the stage we are with HIV. People are questioning whether it can be solved. It can be solved. And we do have many forms of prevention there, fantastic scientific advances. And I think we need to applaud the fact that we now have treatment that can keep people alive with HIV for uh, the normal lifespan. But there are 35 million people infected with HIV and there's 1.5 million people who are being infected every year. Right now, we're trying to get 90% of people onto treatment, and it's costing us over $25 billion every year. And that bill is only going to increase year on year. So the economic argument that we need to have a vaccine is absolutely plain. But the political commitment to give sustained funding to develop a vaccine is still not apparent and needs to be shored up. And we need governments, particularly in the European space, to be pushing to, to develop a vaccine to get to that very end. Because for sure we can control HIV, but if we want to defeat HIV, the only thing that will allow us to actually defeat this virus is to develop an effective vaccine. And science can do that, but unless we have advocates across the world really pushing for a vaccine to be made and supported and a political will to push it over the line, it's going to be a disease that will be here for many generations and cost billions upon billions of dollars. I think just to add a little bit to what Robin said, so even though we have better treatments and the prevention options are improving and have been improving, people are still getting infected. And it's not, it hasn't been stopping. And in some places, the in infection rates are going up. So I do think that a vaccine is absolutely necessary because I think people are forgetting about HIV, especially in Europe. 
Well, I cannot say more than all what Hendo said before, but I think that indeed uh, I really follow the idea that when we have an HIV vaccine, it will be the most sophisticated vaccine produced ever. Uh, and and certainly what uh, uh, and and we still and we are still optimistic because we did ser serious. Uh, uh, um, uh, new developments, new new knowledge came now on, on the design and very sophisticated things that we can do. So certainly, what uh, the 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 good thing on the vaccine and you know, the HIV vaccine research at the moment is that uh, it helps a lot the scientific community to address this question of basic mechanisms underlying the vaccine, the the the. the the response of the host to what we inject as a vaccine. So that's really helped the community to understand what happened in, in the lymph nodes, in the tissues, uh, very early following the injection and whatever. Uh, and that uh, also has consequences for other type of vaccines. So it will in, uh, uh, inform uh, certainly how we can do a vaccine for TB, as you said, or how we can do a vaccine for a parasite, for instance, in the future. So that are very, very important things we learn from that. And finally, what I want to say that because of that, because the need for basic science, I think the HIV vaccine field is still very attractive for young investigators. So there is, there's, we should not be uh, um, a pessimist. I think it's there are many, many things to do. There are uh, there are a lot of data to manipulate so far. There there is a lot of knowledge which is produced. It is a very enthusiastic field. It's also still compared to other vaccines field uh, well financed uh, uh, research. So I really encourage young investigators going into the field of HIV vaccines. Thank you very much. I think we are reaching an end. I would like to uh, thank the panelists uh, one more time. Thank the audience here in the room and the people on the phone. Thank you to the uh, AIV consortium and the EU who is funding exciting research. Uh, I hope you have found this uh, informative and useful and we can do it again. Thank you, Robin, personally. And we're going to end here.